Okay, cool. COVID data. <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple projects out there. This is John Hopkins Center, which has seemed to have taken over kind of the official reporting in the absence of any sort of centralized function doing it, um, which is great, but they don't have public APIs available, not that I found yet, so I can't get to their data. Then there's another project which is affiliated with Johns Hopkins called the COVID Tracking Project which is a bunch of volunteers accumulating state published or even county published or city published data into one central database. So I have all that data and I refresh it from time to time and just play around with it. <laughs> We've got some crazy stuff going on though right now. We've got, you know, what I get frustrated by, by is both political and media narratives on what's going on without looking at the underlying data. Mm -hmm. So you may have heard in the last week, there's been all these spikes, um, depending on where you got the data, it's anywhere between 15 states and 26 states experiencing some sort of spike in case counts right now, which is somewhat true. Um, included in that are three states which have fewer than 20 cases per day, but they're going up, so they're counted as spikes. So Hawaii, Montana, what was a third, maybe Vermont. Um, it's real trace amounts of COVID, but in the media publications, they're being counted as a spike, right? So if you look at a map, they're gonna show up as red right now because they're increasing. <laughs> so very kind of irresponsible media coverage in that respect. Uh, but then there are certainly states where there are case counts increasing rapidly. And we've heard about Florida, Georgia, Texas, California, um, but it's varying, there are different patterns in each state. So in Florida, you kind of have a second wave occurring, but in Texas and California, you have one long wave that, and I guess Arizona too, Arizona kind of had a little bump at the beginning and then has this increasing wave at the end. But if you look at the hospitalization data, only two of those states are experiencing any spikes in hospitalization volume. Of, all, of those five I just named, so the other three are getting these extremely elevated case counts without any increases in hospitalizations. And moreover, only one of those states has a rising death count right now, and that's Florida. And even that you could say is level, but just the last week or so, it's been upticking. So there's something odd going on, which is these increased case counts, which with isolated increases in hospitalizations, but not widespread and no detectable increases in deaths from COVID. So I've tried to dig into that more and all I have is hypotheses at this point. Um, the red Republican hypothesis is that we're just doing more testing, right? They're saying because of more testing, you're seeing more case counts, which I, I think is partially to credit, to blame or to credit here. <laughs> I don't know what the right term is, but to attribute. <laughs> Um, but it doesn't explain the full story. Um, there's other stuff going on. So when I go into the data, I see these very strange anomalies in the data. For instance, in, I believe it's Florida, now don't, don't count me as correct on this, it's one of the states. Their total testing, positive test count, and their new cases are exactly the same number, which means if a person is testing positive multiple times, they're counting that as a new case each time. And that could lead to an increase in, in volumes, right? Particularly as testing volumes increase, you're going to get the same people getting tested over and over, whether that's at their employers or just because they came down with it two weeks ago, now they're, te they're testing three or four times in the course of their sickness, right? And they're showing up as a positive test every time. I think the media is picking that up as a spiking case count, even though it's the same individual who's just testing multiple times. I haven't been able to prove it yet, but given the, the fishy data, I've got to find something, right? I always triple check counterintuitive results, which is what I'm doing. <laughs> um, the other thing that could be going on is the definition of test is nonspecific. So you've got swabs, um, 
then you've got a more rigorous, I think it's called a PCR test that, you know, if you test positive on a swab, you might want to go through PCR test. I don't actually know what that stands for. Then you have um, antibody testing. Any of those three could turn out positive, but in the COVID tracking project, they're all showing up in the same counts. So there's only one number, there's only one test number. Wait, say that again? I didn't quite, I was trying to look at the, what PCR means. Oh, did you find what PCR is? Uh, I'm, I don't see. PCR testing, I'm not a doctor, so. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they actually detect the presence of an antigen rather than the presence of body's immune response or antibodies. So they're looking for the virus. Polymer polymerase chain reaction. Yeah, so I think it's something greater than a swab test, than a kind of quick swab test. Although I could be wrong here. There are different types of tests, I guess, is the bottom line. <laughs> so that one's testing for the actual virus in the sample. Whereas you've got other tests which are testing for the antibodies. So they're, you know, it's blood work, which is finding antibodies. Both of those, if reported as a positive test, would increase your test counts. But in the case, in the latter, if it's just antibodies, it's not actually a new case. It's someone who had COVID months ago, who's just showing up on the radar screen now because they have the antibodies and this is the first time they've been tested for it. I haven't seen anyone really try to dissect this and it gets frustrating, right? Because I feel like I'm the only one <laughs> who's trying to get behind the strange, these strange data patterns that we're seeing. Then there's other data, which I think we all intuitively know, but that just simply isn't getting out. It's not getting published as much. And actually in my mind, reduces the threat level. Although I know why the media wouldn't want to do that or politicians wouldn't want to do that because then if you're wrong, right, you open up society again and you could have outbreaks. Uh, but those two, stories, the data stories that I'm seeing are the prevalence of deaths in nursing and long-term care facilities. And what's the second one? Um, the death rate by age band, which are both just completely unlike anything we've ever seen before. So at least in Pennsylvania, 72% of all of the deaths are attributable to nursing homes or long-term care facilities, 72%. That's a wild number. That's just extremely high. If you look at the national number, it's coming in closer to 30 to 40%, but we've got reporting anomalies there. So New York State, for instance, if you leave your nursing home facility and enter a hospital, they do not count it as a nursing home death. So it's, you just don't have apples to apples comparisons from state to state. And unfortunately, because of a lack of coordinated response from our federal government, there's been no standards imposed upon the state's report, reporting, which in my mind is kind of the only duty of a federal task force, right? Would be to kind of standardize the data and tell the story, but I don't know, <laughs> they didn't do it. <laughs> um, but then the age bands is, is just crazy too. So you have these two metrics, which the WHO, the World Health Organization, CDC are trying to get at, and it's your CFR, your case fatality rate, and your IFR, which is our, your infected fatality rate, right? The IFR is the one that's really hard to get to because we don't know who's infected. CFR is just number of cases divided by number of fatalities, or fatalities over cases. That one just takes a while because the cases take two weeks to a month to kind of clear up and be, to resolve, right? Even after a month, some of the data is inconsistent, so we don't know. The case fatality rate above age 57 is very high. It's really, really scary. Below age 57, this is on par with or much lower than a typical flu season. 
if you're, I think it's 37 or 39, or it might be 59 and 37 or 57 and 39. I don't have the data in front of me. Below that, this is, you know, your, your case fatality rate is, is less than the seasonal flu. So it's almost like a non-factor. But no one's really talking about that. We heard it early on, but it's still not, it's not part of the narrative anymore. But the media is keying in on now our case counts, right? Children in particular, there's been, you know, just trace amount of, of hospitalizations and deaths. Now it's in the hundreds or in the thousands because just as sheer quantities, but on a comparison to other viruses, it's, it's trait. It's just, it doesn't even show up. So just, it's weird, right? It's weird, the stories that we're getting and the, maybe what's even weirder is the stories that we're receiving, right? The people we talk to, what, are the, what impressions are they getting about what's going on? There's so many, when I talk about this stuff, so many of the people I'm talking to have never heard of these things, right? And it's just, even if they have, they haven't absorbed it, right? They're not internalizing it. And they, everyone's forming their own narrative around what's going on. And again, that would have been a great thing for like a federal <laughs> task force to take on to control the narrative a little bit. But it was always this divisive battle, you know, every time they had the task force press conferences. So it never actually got to the point where, I mean, Fauci did a good job, right? Fauci did a good job of trying to control the narrative, but he's a react, like steering way to the health, you know, considering the healthcare impacts and not necessarily considering economic impacts. And he even says, I'm not an economist. And he'll, then he'll say, in, in the interest of public health, here's what you should be doing. But the narrative on the economic side is not being controlled. Right, what is the risk of 40 million un unemployed Americans? What is the risk of all these small businesses shut down, not able to pay rent, not able to open, not able to get PPP checks or whatever it is, all right? No one's controlling that narrative. It's really strange. Hmm. Yeah, my, the first thing that comes up for me is I'm, I'm seeing, okay, we're looking at the healthcare narrative and then the economic narrative. I'm wondering if there's a third or fourth narrative For instance, what? Like a social narrative? Or a... Yeah, like a social narrative. Um, I mean, that's a, that'd be an interesting one to unpack from like, a, okay, everyone's walking around with masks on. Yeah, about Human connection, you know, with eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> How's your, pre like the, the presence of fear in the grocery store for a couple of months was so palpable. Like you could like washing your groceries off when you got home. <laughs> almost like doing this in the grocery store aisles. And I hear stories, I mean, from different folks of someone lashing out and being like, you're standing too close to me or, uh, you know, something like that. So just a, a social narrative around how, how, how can we be with each other in a way that's, um, kind and nurturing and supportive and loving even with uh, health maybe healthy physical distancing <laughs> right like yeah. that narrative healthy healthy proximity <laughs> healthy healthy proximity well yeah this is like and the terms thrown around way too much but new norms right you need to find the new normal term is thrown around way too much but these are you're talking about new norms well and even and even think about like introducing check-ins like in a workplace, in a family, at the dinner table, like how do you how do you actually see how each other are doing? Not just go not just run through how your day went or like talk about talk about the news, but like how are you feeling? Are you feeling fear? Are you feeling sadness? Are you feeling grief? Are you feeling nervousness? Excitement, joy. That's the other thing, is sometimes it was like, can I feel joy right now <laughs> with everything going on in the world? Say more. Is that a 
Am I allowed to feel joy or am I able to feel joy? What's that question? The, that, that I had several, I had several points in, in, I've had several points in the last few months, both in myself and in conversation with others where it was like, I'm feeling some joy right now. Is that okay? Considering everything that's going on in the world. Right. Like it's, it's like judging, judging, feeling joy when there's so much going on. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking economic health care, health nor or health, uh, health, economics, social. Yeah, you know, I saw the media trying to address the social narrative. I think they did a fairly good job of that. Tell me more Which, about that. I don't know if I got that. I haven't been consuming too much media, so I'm. Oh, I was stuck to the tube for a long time. Um, <laughs> I think that's more dangerous than getting coronavirus personally. <laughs> I think so. You're probably right. I don't know how to study that. I don't have any data on it. But <laughs> um, they, in particularly local newscasts, uh, they're out and about. Right? They did a good job of not straying, not causing themselves to stray too far away from what they do well, which is local storytelling. Um, they got back out into the community pretty quickly with masks and long booms and talking to people and showing. And then they would have experts on to talk about what's working, what's not, you know, what you can expect when you go out. I, I did see that. In the Today Show, you know, that, that type of show, the, you know, the long form news shows, they did a good job of showing some stories without fear-mongering, trying to establish some sort of storyline around social norms. But yeah, if you're not consuming the, that stuff on TV, if you're consuming social media, wow, you're not gonna see any of that, right? Yeah, I'm curious out of what you saw in terms of so recommended social norms, were any of them like norms that you would pass on or improve, iterate upon, or what stuck out to you? Um, what stuck out was that the pattern I saw forming was a, fam a pattern of familiarity. So it wasn't necessarily an insight, anything of interest, anything of note, but it was this before I leave the house, can I observe how the world is operating? And so I could become familiar with what to expect. Because um, I don't remember any particularly keen insights that I had, like, oh yeah, I should be doing that, right? It was more of, okay, so that's what the, the grocery store two towns over looks like right now. All right, that's probably what my grocery store is going to look like right now. Thank you for that, right? It was seeing the spacing dots on the floor, seeing the flows of traffic, the arrows and the flows of traffic, having the store manager talking about why they're doing that. That was pretty useful stuff. Mm. But yeah, it wasn't very insightful. There's probably a media narrative too that's forming. Tell me more about that. Maybe it was always there, but this the quote unquote liberal media and then the conservative media seem to be digging in their heels a little bit or a lot. Um, I think they've recognized the new pattern of people consuming headlines, but not necessarily the content of the article. Because that's in a social media setting, which is where people our age and younger are consuming media. That's what they're seeing, right? You see a headline, you click like. Mm -hmm. You may open the article, but even then you're reading a paragraph or two and then you're moving on. I guess you, Mm -hmm. There's just so much. So they have, you know, it's like the 
they have a, twi a tweet, essentially, in order to tell the story of what's going on. And the new, I don't recall seeing this like growing up when I would read newspapers, but this term experts say is showing up in headlines. And it'll be something like, we may be locked down until the end of 2021, say some experts or experts say, not even some, they won't even give you the sum, right? So then your immediate reaction is one of, it's probably a primal response, right? An amygdala response to that. Wow, till 2021, right? I'm fearful. Mm -hmm. But then if you read the article, they'll actually say, they'll interview one guy who says this could last until 2021. And then the, that's the whole article, right? And you see it on both sides. You see it on both sides. But certainly, they're, I think they're entrenching or digging their heels in on their political views in order to establish that headline narrative. Um, and it's becoming, the more analysis they do on likes and shares and, and that sort of thing, that's gonna be self-reinforcing. So if those are the types of headlines that people like and share, then they're gonna keep pushing those types of headlines. I wonder how to quantify any of, um, yeah. It'd be a robust analysis of, of headlines and that'd be hard. In what, in what sense? Like how, like whether or not people consume just the headline or more or the. Whether the actual headline norms are changing. Oh. Yeah. If you look, if you open CNN.com, you're going to see very few articles which have a factual headline, right? Generally it's an opinionated headline or a, it's coming from some sort of angle, right? Well, maybe factual is fine. It is factual, but it's not balanced. Right, They're, it's not the complete story. Right, if it were balanced, they'd be telling the same story I was just telling about hospitalizations and death rates. Right, that would be in the headline, but it's not. The only thing in the headline is the case counts. And it's probably because if they push out stories about hospitalizations and death rates, people aren't clicking on them, so they don't read, they don't continue them. So I'm not sure they're to blame as much as they are a system which has been shifting. Yeah, and in fact, like, if you find a CNN article that mentions hospitalizations and you open it up, there's never data. It's always, they'll mention one city and say this city is seeing an increase in hospitalizations, but they'll make a general statement that hospitalizations are rising. It's, that is irresponsible, right? Because they're not tracking any cities where hospitalizations are falling. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm curious, you said, you said there are three states out of Florida, Georgia, Texas, California, and I think one more that have seen an increase in cases and no increase in hospitalization. Yeah. California is one. So the hospitalization rate in California, in fact, has been falling. And I don't see any stories on it. I don't know why. Um, so, so, so what's the use case here? Somebody goes, somebody orders a kit in the mail or they go to their regular doctor and get tested and get, uh, get diagnosed with Corona and then they just, I wish we had access to that story. I don't know. Um, maybe at the state level, some of that's coming in. So I saw a good story by Florida the other day, Florida governor actually had a press conference and then the, there was an article that detailed out all of his assertions about what's going on in Florida. Um, but in the absence of that kind of news to consume, it's real difficult to understand what exactly is going on. But yeah, it could be that. So it could be more people are getting tested at home or by their primary care physician and not because they're in urgent care facilities. But that wouldn't lead to a declining hospitalization rate, would it? Unless we're picking up way more 
positive tests simply because of the testing volumes, which if the testing volumes are going up, you'd expect to see the test positive rates dropping at the same time, right? Well, it depends what kind of test it is. Yes. If, if, if it's the antibody test, then the more tests we do, the more Kate you'd expect. It depends. I mean, over time, you got to bring time into it. But like, it's my feeling, my hypothesis, <laughs> feeling, <laughs> my hypothesis would be that um, there are a lot more people who've had coronavirus than are even aware that they've had it. Like, especially in the early, yeah. the early stages, right? It's like, so if you had an antibody test, I think you'd see a number of cases climb quite a bit. And even though none of those people might have any symptoms at this point. Yeah. For sure. Although those are the most expensive tests, they also take the longest to process from what I understand. So I'm, again, just a hypothesis because the data isn't available, but I'm guessing they're, they're just still a very small fraction of the overall testing quantity. The other thing you have is false positives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it particularly on the swabs, they can be really high as, as high as 20 or 30%. So if you're testing, 10x more than you were testing a month ago then you're getting you know 20 to 30 percent of those so you're capturing you know you're doubling or tripling your case count from a month ago just based on errors alone <laughs> <laughs> right 10x two times three yeah you're doubling or tripling your case count just because of errors So I don't know how the states are managing that. You do see corrections. So the, the numbers will change from day to day. So they'll go back and take numbers out of last Monday, for instance. Um, but it's been a fun project to kind of figure out how this is all unfolding. And yeah, for a long time, I was trying to predict the death rates and that was very little data to go on and not having any experience in virology <laughs> you know I, I was just basing it off of like Italy's curves and trying to you know look at what's what was going on in Italy and then projecting ours forward found I could project the project the day-to-day -day pretty well but not you know a week out or so it was just completely blind well the other thing that kind of jacks up all the data from my understanding is that um i mean you mentioned the the age brackets but it's like anybody who from my understanding people who are dying with symptoms of coronavirus are being labeled as having died from coronavirus even with pre-existing conditions or something like old age and on top of that you add an incentive ish problem which is that Every time someone dies from coronavirus, you get nine thousand dollars. Yeah, healthcare facility. I'm wondering, like, are the debt? I mean, well, the you know, I I get wrapped up in those too. But then the simple analysis is looking at year over year, or the trends of deaths from year to year, versus 2020, where particularly in New York City you know, the number of deaths on an absolute level that were occurring during this outbreak were something like eight to 10 times higher than normal, just you know, wildly inflated death numbers. So even if they're misattributing some of them, right, the vast majority are, were at least accelerated because of COVID, right? Because you, you mentioned the underlying conditions. Mm. Yeah, they're diabetic. They have all sorts of un other underlying conditions. I think the comorbidity rate was something like 75% of the people who died there. They also had underlying uh, conditions, 75% or something like that in New York state. Um, they would, you know, all of us are going to die eventually. So it's tough to <laughs> attribute anything to, uh,
you might already have what you're going to die of, right? But if you <laughs> die tomorrow of something that complicates it, then what are they going to attribute to? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you look at the year over year, there just were these wild spikes in overall deaths in the population, particularly the nursing home populations. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. So even if it's not Corona, more people are dying from something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. That's really helpful. And how much higher, how much higher is it? I don't want to misstate, um, but it was something on the order of eight to 10 times higher than normal death rates. Um, okay. I'll see if I can find it. I only saw it in New York. Maybe I saw it in Italy at one point too, which is what made me look for it in other places. Um, searching New York death rates by year. Yeah, April 27th, the headline New York Times, New York City deaths reached six times the normal level. So I wasn't that far off. Which is more than the coronavirus count suggested. Hmm. And that's done in an absolute, just a absolute number, number of cases. Or number of deaths, I mean. Yeah, so in... Uh, Not a percentage of something. Yeah, I'll show you. This is pretty crazy, actually. How is that six times? Oh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> That's the area under the curve. Okay, let me share this. Why can I not find... Uh, there we go. Oh, can you make me the host? <laughs> I can. I've done this dance before. <laughs> So this is New York City deaths by week. I mean, this was a month and a half ago, but the uh, dotted line is the expected. So the total area under this curve just through April 27th was 20,900 extra deaths, uh, which was six times higher per day or per week. So it's 1,000 versus 6,000. I'd seen this in a couple other places, but of course, New York's going to be the most pronounced, I imagine. But still, something's going on. It's not a complete hoax. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of fun to speculate, but it's also morbid, right? Yeah. And who am I, you know? Just a guy. <laughs> my hypotheses, my assertions aren't better than anyone else's. Well, it's true for everyone, I suppose. Yeah, I like to think there are people who are more experienced in viral outbreaks than me who <laughs> come up with these hypotheses and are able to test them better than I can. But yeah, they're just guys too. <laughs> <laughs> just guys with hypotheses. <laughs> yeah, I guess in that respect, I, I'm just as good as anyone. <laughs> What data would be really helpful for you? Uh, like I said before, if there were normalized data or consistent mm -hmm. data from state to state. You know, when I scrubbed the testing data to look at whether testing quantities were increasing, there were only 13 states that were reliable that didn't have anomalies that I couldn't even look at. 13 out of 52, I mean, including DC and Puerto Rico in there. 
So that's 25% of the, or 75% of the states are not providing useful testing data. And how, and what's that, I mean, how are you making that distinction? Like what are the, what are the, they're, you're saying there's anomalies, but you can't figure out. I'm looking at some data sets I can show you here. Let's see what's opening right now. Just a minute, there we go. All right, so this is COVID project data. Okay. So this is a metric called sum of total tests. So each state every day is reporting this sum of total tests. Looks like I've already cut a lot out of it. Um, so let me go to the actual raw data here and find this column. Here we go. Sum of total tests. So you see Alabama, null. They're not providing anything. Arkansas. American Samoa, not providing anything. Colorado, DC, Delaware, nothing. All right, so this means A, they're not providing it, and B, this nonprofit, the COVID testing project, despite their best efforts, is not even able to find it. So they're not even publishing it anywhere. Wow. Then even when you get into these, if you take a look at, say, Massachusetts, right? Four days worth. Not useful for me to look at any trends. So, right, I have to cut them out. Mm -hmm. You look at military police t level every day. They're testing 8,000. Oh, these are cumulative numbers, aren't they? Um, okay, so there's, these are cumulative. So, they're not test. They're testing zero right now. Not useful for me. <laughs> Puerto Rico <laughs> testing zero. Or, look, Puerto Rico's number is the same every day. Has mm -hmm. never changed. Mm -hmm. So then, when I finally got it down to what was usable, it was 13 states. It was that year that you saw down here. Where did I get the 13 from? It's over here. When I got when I tried to do tests per hundred thousand, these were the states I could find, just to see if the testing levels were increasing. Right, and they are. You look at Alaska here, they were going from, so these are weekly averages, but the daily averages over the period of a week. So that, sorry, that's a, it's a weird metric, but the week of March 27th, Alaska was testing 33 per day, right? Now they're at 249. And you see this type of trend pretty much across the board. I don't know what was going on in Maine. They weren't testing anyone. <laughs> um, until a month ago, or the, the data just wasn't, they weren't publishing the data before that, more likely. Yeah, because it doesn't go down to one. Yeah, Oklahoma is almost not useful, right? Because it hasn't changed when they just, when they started it. Here's this weird state chart, so California. The orange is your hospitalizations. This is cumulative. So this is how many people are occupying hospital beds in the state from an, who have COVID or they're there because of COVID. That's the orange line. Mm -hmm. Blue line is their increase in case count. So you see it's growing up. It's on a moving average, so it's smooth. Otherwise it's really spiky. This is the smooth, smooth curve. You should see it otherwise, <laughs> it's horrible. Um, and then gray is your death rate, no changes. Right, they're at 80, 72, 80, which is where they were a month ago, which is where they were two months ago, right? So you'll hear spike in case counts, but if hospitalizations aren't rising, if deaths aren't rising, that's an irrelevant headline. Right. Right, there might be spike in case counts of the common cold, right? It doesn't make the news <laughs> because it's not... It's irrelevant, right? We can manage it. Um, Florida looks similar. Oh, there's something wrong with their hospitalization data. They have 200 a day, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, but you can see their case count wildly accelerating right now. And hospitalizations means new people 
checking in, right? Well, or, it appeared when I look at the data, it's both. So the data is not normalized. It's not consistent. So when you ask me what I would wish for, it's a better data dictionary and more consistent reporting. So in so you, some places, it's new cases and in some, it's total hospitalizations. There's probably three possible numbers. It would be cumulative hospitalizations, which are how many to date. Oh, right. It could be total, which is what California was showing, which is, you know, we, we are, have been at this level for a long time. I'm guessing Florida, this is new for Florida, but they're, they're not getting, they're not showing you how many are leaving mm -hmm. either because they recovered or because they passed away. Mm -hmm. So it's almost useless almost useless <laughs> but if it truly is the new hospitalizations with this rising case count you would expect to see a rising new hospitalization rate mm -hmm. which we're not seeing now there should be about an eight day lag between no six day lag between symptom onset and hospitalization at least in the early days there was a six day lag then you have another about seven to 14 days before the deaths show up. And then here's uh, Texas, which is what you would expect to see. Well, one out of two things you would expect to see. So rising case count, rising hospitalization rate, but the death rate hasn't moved. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any stories tell, saying we're better at managing this. And, you know, should we believe the low death rate? What do you mean, should we believe the low death rate? Um, If the case counts rising, we would expect the death rate to rise, but we haven't been given any story as to why it should fall. So I'm not sure whether to believe the data is what I'm saying. On either side, it's either the case data or the death data. One of the two is off. Or there's a story which says we know how to manage this thing now and people aren't dying as much. But I haven't seen that story anywhere. Um, there's, I don't know if you, you can't see my browser, can you? Uh, no, I'm, I'm looking at Excel right now. What, what, what's another option though? In that, in that scenario. Let me like, show you my browser. Yeah, we can think, come up with some hypotheses here. Um, One is, wait, oh, this is the US, okay. I don't know why it's not loading, here we go. No, this is worldwide, I need to find US. Where are my countries? Where are my countries at? This is a different project, this is Worldometer. Have you seen this one? No. It's just a separate, it's a company that started reporting population estimates a long time ago. And when coronavirus hit, they started collecting coronavirus data, data too. And it's been a go-to site for many mm. hobbyists like me. <laughs> so here's your daily case counts in the US. You see the recent spikes. I hate using that word, by the way, increases. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if there's spikes a media word. But here's your, your deaths, very different curve shape. Mm -hmm. And obviously trending downward. So to your question, what else could be going on? The lag can be occurring. So if the deaths take 14 days to materialize, it may be two weeks before we see that increase. But you would still expect the same shape overall if that were the case. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see this valley. Unless in the case of Italy, they, where they had to triage people, right? They had to triage the cases. 
so the death rate went higher because they weren't able, you know, they had, if someone was on their deathbed, they just had to let them expire instead of try to save them. So Italy probably had some sort of magnified numbers, amplified numbers, more deaths than they should have had because they didn't have the capacity to manage. Yeah, the only other thing I can think of is this double counting in the case counts. That there's they're counting people who either had it a long time ago as new cases now, or they're counting the same people more than once. Both of which are some pretty severe data integrity issues. I guess I, 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 the, this feels silly, but the question coming up for me is like, I mean, I guess, so the framing is, how could there be more people getting, how could there be more cases, of more people testing positive for COVID and the same or less deaths? And I'm like, what if, What it what I I don't even know what if people what if people are uh, what if the virus is not affecting people the way it has been? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that be wild? It's become less severe. Yeah, like couldn't the virus become has the virus become less severe, or did it did it did the virus another another possibility is the virus somehow um the people who were most the people who were most susceptible from dying from it got it tested for it and died from it that's interesting because florida has actually seen their average i don't know what average so <laughs> this is just from an, a news story but they've seen their average could be mean could be median um their average age of positive tests fall from the low 60s to the high 30s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Yeah, so if a bunch of people in their 20s and 30s are testing positive for coronavirus and it's not killing any of them, that would mirror the data. Yeah, so in these states where it's been one long, low, one long, long, slow uphill climb, perhaps that's the case, right? It just started in the nursing homes and long-term care, or it could be a different pattern in every state, depending on where the outbreaks were mm -hmm. and what they were catching. You would expect the pattern to be specific to where the outbreaks occurred, not some general trend. Ooh, that's interesting. You take like these meat packing facility spikes that you saw in the Midwest for a while. There were very few deaths associated with those because generally they were fairly healthy young males, right? 40 year olds, 30 year olds. Hmm. So you're telling me the answer lies in complexity of the data. That <laughs> it's just not a simple story. I think I knew that, but I wanted it to be simple. <laughs> That's humbling because I talk about complexity. I talk about not drawing conclusions, right? Not doing A and expecting B in a complex world where there's second order effects. And, I mean, I was looking for the complexity, but I was using simplified hypotheses. What if I made the complex hypothesis? I love it, Forrest, I love it. <laughs> Every state has their own story. Every geography, every 
any geography has its own story. Whether it's a state or a city or a country, right? There's a different story to tell. That makes us hard. You know, it, actually, I, I, if you even keep going down into that, it's interesting to think about each person. And then I even think about systems inside of a person. I mean, if, if we're really trying to draw out a story, but I like where you're, I like where the, the thought trend is going. This is great. Yeah. Um, and right. The, and there's this thing around viruses in summer. So yeah. what, what's it going to be like now that we're, I don't even know what month it is. What is it? June. <laughs> we're going into <laughs> welcome to COVID. Um, <laughs> It'd be like that. <laughs> It'd be like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah what's it going to be like to have the virus um, what's it going to be oh, like there right we're there Ooh, you know what just came up for me what if you were the what if we we keep thinking about this from humanity's perspective what if we thought about it from the virus's perspective Like if you were the virus, what would you be trying to do? Oh, viruses are dead. <laughs> so it's complicated. Um, viruses are dead, so it's complicated. Tell, what do you mean by that? Well, there's no intent, right? It's not like a bacteria where there might be some sort of intent to survive. Mm. Uh, I, I can't even attribute, I can't give the bacteria that much credit. Um, <laughs> you know, I tend to think in more nihilistic ways like we've talked about, which is mm -hmm. the virus just is this is the one that we see because it is the way it is. Other viruses, you know, it's, a, it's the cosmological argument, right? Other, other universes, which could exist, don't because their conditions don't allow them to, right? It's the same thing with virus. Other virus strains that could exist really don't because their conditions wouldn't allow them to exist or at least be newsworthy in our system. The reason it's newsworthy in our system is because of its virulence, because of where it thrives. I'm doing some Googling over here. I'm really curious about viruses being dead. I've heard this, but I haven't actually like looked into it. What are you learning? Uh, the word virus has its roots in the Latin term for poison. smaller than bacteria. Unlike bacteria, it usually um, are, is, is, are really specific about the cells they attack. So I guess for COVID, it's lung cells. Although that's still up for debate. How, tell me more about that. Well, the symptoms are across the board, right? Many report digestive issues, many report, you know, extremity issues, which have nothing to do with lungs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
so bloodborne might be more accurate and just there's some sort of manifestation in the lungs but i don't know i'm not this is where my <laughs> knowledge runs thin if all viruses have a protein coat and a core of genetic material either rna or dna usually rna right Unlike bacteria, viruses can't survive without a host. They can only reproduce by attaching themselves to cells. In most cases, they reprogram the cells to make new viruses until the cells burst and die. In other cases, they turn normal cells into malignant or cancerous cells. Yeah, maybe dead is not the most accurate term. If, they're, if they have a host, it sounds like they are thriving. Where does that come from though? I've heard that viruses are dead. Like I've heard that before. I just don't know what it means. It's a brand new Scientific American article, a magazine devoted to COVID on my, <laughs> on my uh, coffee table downstairs that I should probably read. <laughs> In the absence of a host cell, the virus clearly lacks most of the properties of a living thing. Uh, meaning it doesn't metabolize, it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't. When asked whether I believe that viruses are dead or alive, I answer yes. <laughs> well, it says viruses can't reproduce on its own but it does reproduce with a host. Yeah. So I think it's just a definition problem when we're dead, we need a different word. A, vi a virus doesn't have its own metabolism, but it uses the metabolism of its host. That kind of answers your question, though. What does the virus want? They want hosts. <laughs> if they, you know, if they were animate, intentional. Well, even if it wasn't, even if it's not um, intention, um, not intentional, it could be. Um, like organized, like it could be functional without intentional. Yeah, that's what I meant by it just is, right? This virus exists because it is the way it is. Right. Not because it wants to be this way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right there are millions of other combinant types of viruses that would never live this long because they just, it wouldn't work in our system. Billions, infinite number. So I guess the question is like, what is, I, I asked the question, what does the virus want? Not from the sense that the virus is intentioning it, but like, what is it wanting because it's doing what it does? Because it's ising, <laughs> right? I mean, ultimately, if you if the virus had no hosts, it there would be no virus. Right. So it it it. it I've just never had. I've never had. A, I've never had the thought of. Does a virus? Would a virus actually want to kill somebody because it kills its host? Unless that is somehow helping the virus to have more hosts. Yeah, there's certain conditions, right? If the virus kills people more slowly, it might propagate faster than a virus that kills people quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, you know, I don't want to use the term wants because I'm not sure that propagation is better than no propagation, but that's what happens, right? It is, it is. <laughs> well, it's like, have you ever played that game, the pandemic game on your phone? 
Yeah, I stopped playing it back in January when this all went down. <laughs> I just didn't want to do it. What's it called? I forget. Pandemic Inc., maybe? Yeah. yeah. But you notice how if you upgrade the virus too quickly and make it too deadly, then it, the virus then the, it ends up going away. Because it, kill, it needs to be it, – it kills people faster than it can infect people. Plague Inc., Plague Inc. Plague, right. So if it if it gets in somebody and and you and you upgrade the virus to a point where it's like a, basically like they have I forget the latest ones but it, it costs like twenty points in the later stages of the lethalness of it to make it so like tumors and you're bleeding and everything but like if you do that and it's not very um, contagious if you don't start upgrading its contagious vectors then then the virus ends up dying out because it kills all of its hosts without being able to spread. And so you sort of, the whole time you're playing the game, you're factoring in, making it, you, you really want to infect everybody and make it deadly, but not like from the virus, from the plague perspective. But if you make it too deadly too quickly, it's like it, it, the virus dies out. <clears throat> and, it, and then if you, if you, from the game perspective, if you make it really contagious at first, but you don't start killing anyone or make, or make the symptoms more complex or something like that to confuse the, the medical industry component of the game, then they can help work with the antibodies or whatever. And then you can't upgrade to kill anybody. Yeah, it takes too long. Right. right. So it's interesting to, to see like, yeah, be, how did the Spanish flu, which killed 40 to 50 million, differ from coronavirus? Oh, it's still with us today. <laughs> um, coronavirus might still be with us forever now, too, though. We don't know. Because there's a societal component, too, right? There's how fast does information travel? How fast does knowledge travel? Um, how quickly do the norms change like we're talking about? And that's kind of what the lockdowns of the stay at home orders are meant to do, right? It's forcing a, a norm change. There's how global are we, right? The transportation vectors that carry this thing Mm -hmm. Cross borders. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the questions that I'm really in after seeing how things have unfolded this time, and wondering if something like this ever happened again, is like, um, I guess I want to move from the right, like we've talked about, move from the problem orientation to the possibilities orientation right so like most of the way we handled this was like oh here's a problem let's fix the problem fix the problem fix the problem fix the problem yeah so what possibility would you want to bring into existence here well it's a great question I mean, is it possible for us to have healthy enough immune systems to where Corona was a non-issue? So there you go. There's another one of the narratives that has not materialized. All right, we said there was public health narrative. There's a economic, economic and all those, but there's also this social, personal health personal health narrative, which should be at the forefront. You're right. What is it about young people? What is it about children? Why do they not even show symptoms or die from this thing? And what can we learn about how we treat our own bodies as we age and yeah. Yeah, and how do we start to take responsibility for our own personal health and not just outsource it to the experts?
Yeah, is this is our personal health better now than it ever has been, or is it worse now than it ever has been? I mean, it it <laughs> that's a, there's a lot of layers to that. It, I mean, it depends who you're talking to. I'd say for you know for the for people who have taken responsibility and interest in the personal health, I'd argue it's it's the best it's ever been, you know, in people who study health and look at different stages of human development and combine that with what we've learned in modern medicine. I'm, I'm being really quick to answer this question. I don't know, actually. That's a really it's okay. You can just talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I think like, okay, the, um, for your average con like, person i was going to say consumer but for your average person who spends a ton of time in artificial light eats a bunch of processed food sugar consumes a lot of television and like phone i mean yeah, i'm talking about artificial light like not a lot of time in nature not a lot of time in the sun you know the health is probably the worst it's been in the history of humanity now that person can if they have a headache, take an Advil, or if they cut their finger, they can use Neosporin and a Band-Aid. So that's, they have the privileges of modern medicine. But from but a there's med also a de-risking element to that, right? When you're out in the sun, when you're outdoors, when you're exercising, you're introducing risk, which on average might actually be worse for you than this completely sterile, de-risked environment that we live in today. Right, and that for me is the thing, is the whole consciousness around coronavirus was let's get everybody to be as sterile as possible. It wasn't how do we go through the suffering process to become stronger, which is what everybody who's into health actually does. Oh, I'm gonna go two days without eating, or I'm gonna go work out and literally break down my muscles so they can grow stronger, or I'm gonna go run around and sweat a bunch and become exhausted. Like that's all about pain for growth not sterilization. Yeah. But it's got risk to it, right? All of those things. More risk than the sterile environment in some respects. There's ri I was well, it depends on uh, that yes, on a temporal perspective though. Like maybe the sterile environment is lower risk in the short term, but in the long term, the sterile environment's probably more at risk. Whereas the short term, the risk. Yeah, I see that in the actuarial tables in life insurance. If you could, if you had the ability to run a mile, right, or walk a mile even, you were rated much cheaper than someone who couldn't or didn't. Um, but kayaking a mile, right, is probably more risky than being sterile, All right? The accident rates will start to spike. And on average, that population, so this is all actuarial, right? <laughs> so it's a lot of averages. Yeah. Where do the deaths occur? Where do we want them to occur? Well, yeah, and, and, and we really, um... Uh, I'm just looking at the time. Let me make sure I don't have another thing right now. Oh no, we're good till eleven. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, we got more time. We got time. Um, well, the other thing there too is that the whole isn't the underlying assumption that dying, living longer is better. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that for sure. But I mean, that's that's what we're. When we're talking about risk in these things, we're talking about it within the context of, of a longer life. Like, is Yeah, maybe it's dying healthy is better than dying sick, right? Wouldn't we rather have that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes. You know, I'd, I'd rather live 30 years of an active, exploratory, adventurous, fun-filled life than 300 years of, um, you know, watching YouTube videos every day. 
like all day, every day. If I just sat in a chair and was told I'm not going to get sick, but all you can do is. Yeah, there's a quality of life index. I wonder if it has any of this stuff in it. I don't think it does. I think it's, I think it's at the national level, so it's not useful. By country. I don't know much about it. But is that kind of what, is that the question this is begging, which is, how do we live our highest quality life? I think that's certainly part of the possibilities orientation. Because then we start to say not, I mean, the problem orientation is how do we stop a virus? <laughs> like, how do we prevent a pandemic? How do we prevent as many people from dying as possible? The possibilities is like, what do we want to create? <laughs> yeah. You know, what is, what kind of life do we want to live? Yeah, and some of that can have redundancies and safeguards against risk, right? That'd be okay, cause as long as you design it in, right? As long as it's not reactive, yeah. But it's not just, oh, something pops up, slap it on there. Something else pops up, slap it on there. It's, there's an updraft to it. What do we actually want to create? And then how do you mitigate risk in creating that, of course? Yeah, that's just your design how you, standards. How do you integrate risk in, in creating that? Yeah, that's the question, right? Where does it get designed in and how? Yeah, you see examples, the far kind of far extreme examples, like extreme athletes are uninsurable because they're introducing too much risk in their lives. They're living a great life, but from an insurance perspective, they're uninsurable. That's the metric that I'm most familiar with is insurability and insurance rating, which is probably a pretty good proxy for quality of life. <laughs> the more uninsurable you are, the better life you're living. <laughs> no, I meant the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was bringing from my extreme a, From a hedonistic perspective, maybe. Like the more <laughs> no, I, I was going the other way. If you're uninsurable, you're either unhealthy or you're too risky. Right. All right, your extreme athletes are very healthy, mm -hmm. but they're uninsurable mm -hmm. from a life insurance perspective, from a term life perspective. Yeah, I have to caveat a lot. <laughs> you know, they can choose to insure themselves through whole life policies. That's fine. Um, it's also interesting for me that the insurance company decides like the whole model of the insurance, co it's not co-created with people. Originally it was. The original models for insurance were community-based. Okay. It was, you know, people pooling their funds together in advance of a tragedy versus when the tragedy happens. Mm -hmm. Then you had that product philosophy developed, right? It started to develop itself and it still exists today. It's called micro insurance and you see it in Africa, you see it in um, religious communities. Mm. You, you'll see this micro insurance thing pop up. I and mean, that's just the business model. That's just the model of the product. The, Insurance companies just took that and said, hey, I can build profit in here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, the, the for-profit ones. There's an advantage to being the holder of these funds. And the better you are at the decisioning up front, the more advantage you have to hold the funds. The better you are at the decisioning on the back end, and that's called underwriting on both sides. So you underwrite up front and then you underwrite the claims. <clears throat> and that's where the insurance expertise lies, is can I accurately judge your risk? And then claims underwriting is can I actually accurately judge what just happened and get and pay the right payout? That's where their expertise is developed. Um, so even in a company that's not for profit, like a mutual company, like Mass Mutual, for instance, they're owned by the policy owners. So in theory, it's just this microinsurance policy on a larger scale. Um, 
there's no profit incentive, but there are, say, overhead costs built in. So there's incentive to manage overhead costs and not let those get out of hand. Um, What was your question? I was going somewhere with all that. <laughs> You're making an observation, observation about it. Is, um, insurance isn't co-created with the people who are being insured, and you were saying it originally was. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in the case of a mutual company, I think that's okay. Thank you. That's, I think it still is in some respects. You have, as a consumer, full choice around which company you choose to do business with, unless you're getting it through employer contract or something through the federal government but we just we're further distanced from it from that sense of community we're starting to see some co cool startups on blockchain which are bringing the community back the community sense back so you take this underwriting expertise out of the insurance companies mm -hmm. and then you allow groups of friends to insure themselves again that's cool where there's a common interest but i haven't seen any of them really start to scale at all Well, everything I'm seeing right now in all the different domains is that com the community is resurfacing as the as like a theme. Like we want to have uh, economic, social, um, uh, emotional. Like we want all these different ways of connecting in a community, not just sort of one one dimensional communities oh these are my colleagues these are my friends these are my workout buddies or whatever we're, we're, there's like a thing about coming online and all these communities I'm, I'm involved in at least half a dozen communities right now and i'm seeing that they're they, they are evolving like we got together with one with one intention and then it, it, it grew and there's more more of who we are comes into the community there's so much about showing up fully, bringing all of who you are. And, um, I saw this in the corporate culture space, right? The transition from a 20th century company to a 21st century company kind of went from command and control. You think of your madman mad men type company, right? Where you have the boss knows everything. Mm -hmm. And unless the boss says it's so, it's not so, right? I wait for direction from the boss. I don't do anything without direction. I, I won't, you know. Um, that's a one-way communication model. Then you evolve into a two-way model where we start saying, you know what? These employees are specialized. Mm -hmm. They know more than I do. Mm -hmm. Let me get them involved in the conversation. This was your kind of the genesis of systems thinking. The answer's in the room or collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. The answer's in the room. Let me figure out ways to have a great two-way dialogue about what's going on. Mm -hmm. But it's still, it wasn't systematized. It was, the, the evolution is to go from one way to this blocky two-way, right? Let's have a, a all-employee meeting where we let the employees ask questions. <laughs> Let's do focus groups, right? But then what you're talking about is this third evolution, which is this community-based communication structure where the people who need certain information reach out to the other people who have it. And you don't wait for it to flow up through the mm -hmm. chain of command and then back down. You allow that, you build the structures. And this is the creation part that's so fun is what would it take to build those structures where people have access to the information they need to make the right decisions on the fly. Have you read Reinventing Organizations? Yeah, yeah. This is the loose whole thing, right? What I'm seeing yeah. in the the company com, uh, the companies i'm going to use that because i don't it's not you can't hardly even call them companies in this in what you're talking about the third tier or teal these these later stage organizations and what i'm noticing is it's it's actually not how do we design the structure it's how does the structure emerge to meet what's happening yeah how do you stay out of the way <laughs> really I mean, great and and yeah. what we see is there's so much um for me all of this starts to point towards nature because we give at later stage organizations, we give the organization a consciousness of its own. So like you said, we were in command and control. Like I'm the CEO, I'm going to tell everybody what to do. But now we're in sense and respond. Mm -hmm. It gets me really curious around what would it be like to sense into coronavirus and respond to it 
because we've taken a total command and control thing, right? Oh, it pops up here, whack. Oh, it pops up here, whack. Like we're playing COVID whack-a-mole, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Let's beat it out of the problem as opposed to let's feel into it and respond to it. And yeah, that would be great where if the data, and this is kind of full circle, right? If the yeah. data were available to everyone to make their own decisions and there was a, but there was someone distilling complex data and right. you knew where to access that, you could make great decisions for yourself and your family and the people around you and you could talk about it and be, oh my God, yeah, it would have been so, such a better response <laughs> for people like you and me, right? <laughs> Well, and I, and I, my hypothesis is that actually a lot of people would be really interested in playing that game. I mean, I've seen, the thing is, is people are really interested in what's going on right now, but their only source of information is Fox and CNN and the television. People don't know how to do what you just did of going and pulling data from an API and importing it into an Excel sheet and starting to make graphs and then making meaning out of it. Like, if, if that process, yeah, that's, what one in a million, right? One yeah, in a million. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. So then if you took, if that data, if that part was done and it was available in an app and people could go in every day and actually get information, I think that the, the questions, I, I believe people want to play that game. It's just that all people get is, Oh, there's a spike or, Oh, cases are going up, but they don't know. Yeah. Oh, that means there's 20 cases instead of 15. Right. Like, <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Hawaii has 18 yesterday. <laughs> Alaska had 14. Both are rising. And Montana is the other one. Where is it? 11. <laughs> they say Hawaii's cases are rising from 14 to 18. On average, the slope of the curve's going up. Yeah. Depends what metric you look at. That's why it's always different. Is it 17 states? Is it 26? Mm -hmm. Some some are looking at yesterday versus today. Others are looking at five-day moving averages. Others, you know, choose whatever you want. When you try to make a headline, you have to, you know, dilute the information. Yeah. Well, how, how do I... How do I make the how do I make the data say what I want it to say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the case of the media companies, this I want clicks. I want people to share this. I want them to like it. I need the advertising revenue. I need eyeballs on it. So I got to elicit some fear response because that's yeah, so funny. Right before you said that, the phrase that came up for me was "fear has gone viral." Fear, fear is viral. Fear is the Fear is a virus. And it's human nature, right? It's what we react to. We've got to. Well, it's our most yeah. primal, it's our most primal brain. Yeah, you have to override it, right? You have right. to override it. And we're capable of doing that. That's, that's the cool thing about the integration of it. Like we were saying, integrate with the virus, integrate the risk into our model, integrate integrate fear how's the fear trying to help why are, why are we creating fear maybe we're creating fear right now because we realize how how surface level so many of the institutions that we've found so much safety in are and how <laughs> how easily rattled they are right yeah maybe yeah. that's maybe that's a really good thing that we're creating some fear around that yeah, but it creates instability. But yeah, it could be good. It's just not going to be comfortable. Yeah, and I mean, the sense if we if we treat that fear as a bad thing, and then we take an anxiety pill, or we try and make it go away, we're keeping that same problem solution orientation. Whereas if we actually bite the fear in and say, why are we creating this fear? Oh, yeah, maybe it's not. Maybe we should consider some other ways to source food and nutrition for our bodies. Besides just popping in the grocery store and buying it. Like, what if all these what if all these front yards of green grass were, were rows of food and you just could, I keep having this dream. I've had this recurring dream over and over again about like yards growing food and buckets out in front of houses where people could just put extra. No, you talked to me about that. Yeah. Anybody could walk by and just pick up something if they need it. I know I'm living in a fantasy world, but it would be, it would be really cool. <laughs> like when you, if you think about possibility, um, 
I'm getting, I might be getting a little off topic, but <laughs> do we have a topic? <laughs> we can talk about that next time. I love that idea though. What's, you know, what's preventing that? What's standing in the way? How a lot could of we? Government regulation. It's illegal. Oh, yeah, in a lot it's of illegal cases. Illegal in a lot of places. <laughs> but I mean, societally or from human behavior standpoint, um, even like economically, right? we've talked about property in the past. You know, what are property rights and right. how does that play in? What's the answer? Um, well, I love this thought experiment of moving to Mars. What, what would the right government be when you move to Mars? And how would you manage it? Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot as a human race. So how would we do it if we had to start over? Well, and why do we need to? Why do we need to move to Mars to start? No, it's just a thought experiment. Thought right, experiment. Sure, sure. <laughs> but I mean, the, I, I, we've talked about this, right? Like, if we just yeah, yeah, yeah. If we just take if we take as we are to Mars, we're going to be fighting a Mars to Earth war because that's what we do. <laughs> like, I know. We need to. If you try to take my land away from me in, yeah. in some public interest. I'm not. I'm going to say no. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 As I'm conditioned the, to love my land, right? So there's got to be a way for us. There's got to be a way ahead, way forward. Uh, I'd love to. I just love being in these questions. Like I feel the the feeling of possibility is quite animating. Like it's got this kind of. I feel like when I'm trying to when I'm trying to solve problems, I have this kind of feeling, like I'm pushing down, like stop. <laughs> and when I'm in possibility, it's like got this vertical updraft to it. Have you read Atlas Shrugged? Yeah. <laughs> it's very capitalist, but it's the same type of feeling, right? The... Right. That's what I'm waiting on. I'm just waiting on my walk down the street and someone says, Who's John Galton? I'm like, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Don't wait for it. Just start it, man. Just start it. <laughs> you don't need a leader. That's what I've been taught. You just go. Just go. I got a piece of land. That's that's top. That's like on top of my radar right now. Is get a piece of land and build. I'm calling it the ranch. <laughs> Grow my own yeah, food. my land, but it's managed by a homeowners association, which is that's the style of government that I prefer, actually. So I'm okay with it. Yeah. No. As long as we have a say in what's in the homeowners association. So, all right, well, it looks like we're up on time here and I gotta get ready for a, another meeting in a bit. Had a blast as always, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was a good call, yeah. fun. We'll talk soon. All right, man. Cool. Have a good week. Yeah, you too. Bye. -bye. Bye.